All right, so um, yes, this will be on section 35, right? So ensemble, so the idea is like, was it last time? I guess it's been a week since we last talked. So last time was um, decision trees, right? So we're kind of moving into ensembles and ensemble basically is that we're gonna combine these things together, um, multiple um, learners, and essentially combine them to make essentially a super learner, okay? So um, note that um, I kind of, I constantly make these updates to the, um, notebooks that I use, but um, sorry, I got too many windows open here. Um, so just know that if you're kind of following along with the uh, repos in here, um, one thing to note that I kind of try to make a little bit, um, kind of bring it up is I put in on the README for that repo, kind of like showing you the different sections. So it's a little bit easier to kind of navigate through because I know kind of bounce around a little bit between different directories. Um, so that way it's a little bit easier to see what's going on with uh, the different parts. So talking about ensembles, like for example, this is um, going to be different since I'm going to split it up as you can probably see ensemble methods, bagging, boosting, we're going to separate those out a little bit. Um, that way versus like one long you know, notebook, it's a little bit more manageable and kind of easy to refine. Okay, cool. So ensembles, so why ensembles? So I, I want to know, is anyone know Captain Planet? Like I was just talking to other instructors about this, like give me a thumbs up if you like know Captain Planet. And give me like thumbs down. You're like, I have no clue what you're talking about, Victor. <laughs> okay, I see a lot of people. All right, I did this with another cohort, and I realized that no one knows Captain Planet. So maybe a better scenario would be like Voltron, right, or some other like Power Rangers or something where you have multiple people combined together. Um, if you haven't seen Captain Planet, it is it is an interesting show. Um, the superhero basically is um, how do I say this? It's kind of focused on like recycling. Um, like it's if I would do like put it in the weirdest way, it's propaganda for recycling back in the 1980s to the 1990s. Um, it was one of those shows where it's like, if you watch it, you're like, wow, this is pretty campy and pretty like uh, ridiculous. Uh, but it's a, I don't know, it's a fun show. But the idea here is that um, each of these, you know, you can see that these little superheroes, right? These kids have these special rings and their powers, powers combined brings up Captain Planet, which is like a superpower, you know, um, superhero guy. So that's really what we're doing. We're basically making our superhero from our kind of like individual machine learning, which each individual machine learning algorithm can be very, very powerful, but combining them together can make them even more powerful. And that's really what Ensemble is really doing here. Um, the big thing about here too is that um, things like decision trees, uh, one big issue with decision trees is that, well, first of all, they're deterministic, right? So you can't really like train a decision tree better. It's really like whatever you put in the um, uh, decision tree is like what it is. But one problem with it is that it tends to overfit. We tend to get these like very boxy, if you imagine what decision trees, like drawing the little lines around here, it gets a very like um, boxed uh, boundary between the two. And it's not really ideal for a lot of things because most things are a little more smooth, a little more organic. Um, so ensembles will actually alleviate a lot of this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like the idea of like why we even talk about ensembles, like why it's worth doing. So there's two main methods we're going to talk about, bagging and boosting. Note that these aren't really technically the, all the methods, like there are other things to make ensembles, like combining things. One example is something called stacking, where essentially you um, have multiple uh, machine learning algorithms to kind of go to the next one kind of deal. And so we're not going to talk about that one because it's a little less common, uh, but just know that also exists out there. All right. So Let's go then into the bagging method. So bagging, um, which sounds like it should be something about like, you know, quote unquote, putting in bags, is actually not that. It actually stands for uh, bootstrap aggregation. So um, this is kind of like, um, we talked about bootstrap. So can anyone remember like what was bootstrap sampling? Let me say something like uh, bootstrap. I know it's been a while, right? So yeah, bootstrap sampling is basically pulling a random sample. And when we say something's, you know, a bootstrap sample, what we mean is basically a random sample with replacement. Okay, so that's really what we say boots, whenever you hear the word bootstrap now in data science, think like random sample with replacement. So you can basically like imagine like having a hat of like different, you know, like things you can pull out of it and you pull out, you know, like someone's name, for example, you read it off and then you stick it back in the hat, mix it up a little bit and pull it out. You probably won't pull the same exact name, but it's possible, right? That's really what bootstrapping um, talks about. So again, what we're going to do is um, use a bootstrap sample. So we're going to use a random sample and train it against the same algorithm over, like 
the same algorithm over and over again, but with different samples essentially. And then we use those different like algorithms and essentially vote to select what's the best, you know, way to classify it. So if you kind of imagine this like in a classroom, I like to imagine this like kind of like, we want to take the average of the class. Like you can imagine like each individual learner, like each uh, student is not like super, like let's say they have different knowledge, right? And you give them like a general test, right? And so the idea here is like you might you give them like a different test and you can combine their tests together and say, well, okay, see how well they perform. So like if the majority of the class votes, oh, it should be this classification, that's the one you go with. And that's really what's bootstrapping going through here. Um, I put a little note here is that if you were not to use a bootstrap sample, so we're not using bagging anymore, but if you do something with uh, random sampling, but without replacement, so you don't put the name back in the hat, it's called pasting. Though note that it's not as common um, to use this form because basically you lose some of the, um, you don't get as much data, right? It's a little more deterministic. And so bootstrap actually turns out to be, tends to be a little bit better and tends to be more commonly practiced. Okay, so some methods for bootstrapping. Okay, so or sorry, not bootstrapping, but bagging. Okay, the most powerful one that I really want to talk about is the random forest. Like you will hear random forest talked about all the time because um, in general, like we'll talk about neural networks and other advanced algorithms. And it turns out a lot of times random forest is a pretty solid like machine learning choice. Um, like if you have to like take a bet on any algorithm to see how well it does, random forest you tend to do a good job. And what's kind of fun is like, we'll kind of see why it's called random forest. It's basically it's because it's a bunch of decision trees. So random forest and we're using random sampling, random forest, cool, right? Probably one of the more creative like names I think of all like the machine learning algorithms. All right, so let's check out in this notebook then some things about bagging. So, all right, so like I said, it's bootstrap aggregation. And this is kind of coming from the curriculum itself. Um, kind of, I put a little quote here is like train weak learner learners to combine together into one via voting. So the idea here is you have like weak learners and don't be tricked by the name weak learners. What that really is saying is that there is some kind of like machine learning algorithm. But when we say weak, it doesn't necessarily mean like they're not very good. It just means that they're just by themselves essentially. So we're trying to make a better learner and we combine them together basically. say, all right, you train on this sample, you train on this sample, you train on this sample, and you go ahead and tell me what you think it is. And then you can see here like this bootstrap sample fed into each decision tree. And then we pass this decision to vote on saying, what do you think uh, the classification should be? Okay, so um, note that there's a few ways you can do this. Um, we'll talk about a few things, but one is like basically doing, um, taking the sample itself, so like your training data. And so you can actually do something like a holdout, like a, what we call like out of bag and use this to do validation. But the idea here is that you feed it different amount of data and it feeds it all together and voting it together. Um, another thing we can do is actually change this model each time. And so we can actually randomly kind of like modify each tree. And we'll talk about why that happens too. Okay. Um, this is follow for everyone. It's a relatively straightforward idea, right? Okay. And we all know how decision trees kind of work, right? So um, again, it's a really simple classification. Um, one disadvantage for this, which I don't know if I talk about directly. Um, can anyone guess what disadvantage, just looking on what you know already of um, doing like something like a uh, you know, backing or like Brandon Forrest. Picks up a lot of memory for yep. small power. Yeah, that's right. It's going to take up one, a lot of memory. Once you're even done training, right? So one is like actually computing, right? So you imagine you have to train each individual model. The good thing is decision trees are relatively straightforward to train, but even doing, um, all of that and after you're done training, you have to store the tree. And you can imagine if you have like eight different trees, right? You have to store each of those trees. Um, usually when I say eight, it's gonna be much higher than that. So you can, it's not super condensed, which might not be the best thing. For example, if you want something, um, let's say like, if it's going to live on a device for deployment, like an IOT device, internet of things, like think of like a little tiny camera or something like that, or something that's gonna be like, not using a whole lot of computation or not a lot of memory. Um, it might not fit well on that thing. Um, if you guys, um, let's see here. Like if you use Siri or Google Assistant, um, Google Assistant had something like this where they had recently like changed this. Um, it's not that it used a random forest, but their model existed as a hundred gigabytes. There's no way you're gonna get a hundred gigabytes on a phone, right? It's just not gonna exist, right? It's really good. It's good at detecting everything, but it means you to send all the information up online somewhere else and then put it in, which takes time. 
And they had just recently, basically, they did some strategy and different models and stuff and made it to something like 500 megabytes, which is much more reasonable for a phone and be able to do that offline now. So note that there's always gonna be some um, back and forth of exactly what you should do. So no machine learning model is perfect for every situation. Okay, I'd throw that in there. But going into random forest, let's see kind of like how this works. So like essentially the good thing is that it's super, um, it's like kind of like, it's a super uh, learner, right? It's kind of like a super friend. Like if you kind of like combine all like your different, you know, abilities together and combine it into one, you have a super friend. So you imagine some person's like really good at math and another person's really good at like, let's say, I don't know, chemistry. And another person's really good at like history. And like you combine those like knowledge together, you now have someone who's gonna be good at history, um, math and science all together, right? Um, it's high performance, which means basically it's going to perform really, really well. It's going to be low variance and low variance is going to be a huge plus because bus before decision trees tend to have high variance. It tends to overfit in these ways. And so by having it kind of train on different parts of it, you actually decrease the variance, which is a good thing. Um, it's also relatively transparent. Basically it's inherited from decision trees, right? So if you have many decision trees, as we saw, decision trees are pretty like, um, it's pretty obvious to say, oh, like how you decide on what makes something, um, like why you made this decision to go either left or right. Uh, random forest is either just gonna be many decision trees, but you can always pull it out from there. So you can know why it chose the thing. Um, later on when we talk about other algorithms, especially things like, the, um, I'm looking at like neural networks in particular, um, you really don't know why it chose the things it did. There's not like a real explanation from it. So um, that's more like a black box, they call it. Basically you stick stuff in and it outputs the result, but you don't know why the results came out the way it did. So this is really useful of understanding like what's it actually learning from. Okay, well, makes sense for everyone. Any questions on the, how random forest can be beneficial? All right, cool. So some of the bad stuff, like I said, uh, we got so many trees, right? First of all, we have many, many trees, like Thomas said, it's computationally expensive. We have to train every individual model, right? So it's no longer just one tree now. It's like we're training many, many different ones, right? So you can imagine as you kind of add more and more trees, your uh, random forest will probably get, be better and better because there's more kind of people kind of um, adding to it. However, it's gonna be computationally expensive, right? And then memory, like I mentioned, you have to store all the trees in memory. Um, I kind of put a little note here, think back to k-nearest neighbors. In order to do k-nearest neighbors, to train it, you can do it, but then the problem is you're gonna have to store all that information. So the same idea here is you have to store each of these trees in memory. Cool. Um, all right, so this is where we can do some, um, some interesting stuff. So one is like, you know, we can bootstrap the sample itself, which is what we usually talk about random forest. But what's also kind of cool is that we can also make a sampling on not just the actual um, like data that comes in, but also kind of modify each decision tree. So you can imagine here, um, the curriculum kind of shows model one, model two, model three. This could have been just model one, model one, model one, model one, model one, like basically it get completely identical and feed in different data. The thing is, is that it's not a great idea. And the reason why, um, the great analogy I have for this is a banana tree. So I don't know if anyone's familiar, familiar with like banana trees and the genetic variety of banana trees. Um, thumbs up if anyone is. Um, that's a, kind of a shot in the dark. Yeah, I see some headshakes. Okay. Um, so kind of fun facts about banana trees. Um, they are very susceptible to cannabis disease. Um, and that's probably, that's basically because all banana trees are essentially clones of each other. Um, every banana, when I say banana, most of the bananas you buy like from the grocery store are literal clones of each other. And so it turns out like for cannabis disease, um, if they ever find um, pandemic disease, which is like a fungus in um, a grove of banana trees that they're cultivating, they will literally burn the whole forest, down, like their whole like, you know, like acres of forest because they don't want that thing to spread because it's really easy to spread up. Turns out this actually happened before. So quite fun history lesson. Um, your banana tree or the bananas that you probably buy, like, you know, like the long ones, you know, not, not like um, plantains, but the like traditional like bananas. Um, those are actually the Cavendish banana and they're all clones of each other. But before we actually had a better banana called the George, I think it's, oh, it's like the Michaels, Michelson's banana. Oh, I wouldn't say George Michael, but that's not right. But I wouldn't say the Michelson banana. Um, and basically it was a different kind of banana and it died out because they were all exactly the same. So decision trees are just like bananas. You don't want them to be all exactly the same. Otherwise they'll fall for the same kind of like, you know, issues. So what we can do instead is basically breed many, many varieties of these different trees. So not only do we do one actually um, 
random sample of the actual training data, but we also can random sample on how the uh, tr um, decision trees will be created. So different hyperparameters, different parts in there. And so there's a few steps we can do this. Um, and I think the curriculum kind of walks through a little bit of this. I'm just gonna very briefly kind of go through the different steps. So the first idea is that we take our data and we save, save a portion of the data for validation called out of bag and the rest for trading. So ideas for the out of bag part is saying, okay, we're gonna use this to test our little tree that we're drawing here. And our bag is basically kind of thinking like the water and the sunlight and the fertilizer that we're feeding into this tree to grow our decision tree. Okay, so that's our data. Um, then the rest of the data for the train, the bag, mm -hmm. is then split up to randomly be selected for different predictors. So the idea here is that um, we can use that random part of the data, right, and grow our different trees. So every tree gets exposed to a slightly different variation, essentially different amounts of sunlight, different amounts of like, fertilizer, the whole idea, right? Then we basically grow and train those with different features. So like I said, we have like slight variations of those different trees. And we basically have these decision trees. We have them all trained, we're all set. Now what we do, we take our out of bag stuff. So the stuff that's never been trained on yet, right? But it's still from our training data, but the trees have never seen this data before. And we say, okay, take this out. And we say, hey, um, let's test out our different trees and see how well they perform. And this basically will give us our you know, out of bag error. So basically this is our validation error to say, hey, how will these trees do? And you can just keep repeating this process going through and making new trees to do better and better on this out of bag error. So the idea here is that we can get better and better trees without ever having to look outside of the training data itself that we feed it. Okay, does that make sense to people? Like the overall kind of process? Any questions on like this overall process, like how we grow our random forests? Cool. Thumbs up if your sounds good. Slides over like, I don't know, thumbs down. Okay, I see some sideways. So is anyone like brave enough to kind of share like maybe what might be a little confusing on this part? Okay, maybe not. Maybe we'll come back a little bit. All right. The main idea here is that like um, the important part is that we don't just randomly pick out some data. We also use different predictors. So the idea here is that like you might only predict off of like four different features out of the 10. And so that one tree has only predicted off of those four features. And this prevents it overfitting on top of all the features at once. And that way we get a little bit of variety. Now, no one tree is going to be very good at prediction, right? You can imagine if only giving it like four of the 10 features, it's not going to do very well, right? But the idea is that if we do this with many, many trees, we get a hard, uh, large variety and then com combined will perform well but also we get kind of like a little more um, robustness in each, in the whole collective of all the trees. Okay. And that's really what I want to kind of emphasize about that random forest. Okay. So again, like the reason why it's beneficial, we have less overfitting, right? It's basically, we have more robustness. We have variety, right? And that's what we want, right? We don't want it to think it knows what it's doing. We want it to say, okay, when I say it knows what it's doing, we don't want it to make it make predictions and think like it's really confident, right? Basically it's high, by, um, high by variance. Cool. All right, so, so quick code then, right? So kind of see how this looks like. And I, like you can see like that kind of like sounded very complicated. This is relatively straightforward when we actually perform this. So I'm using SK learns here and I actually took half this code probably from, if you go to the documentation on like ensembles random forests. Okay, I know it's a classifier too. You can actually use decision trees to do regression and stuff like this, but we're using uh, estimator or classifiers. Um, and you can see like all these different options we have here and you can kind of go through it and play around with it and see what the documentation says. But I'm um, just using the code right here. So if you wanted to follow along on parts of it, you could do something like this in an example. So kind of quickly showing you guys what that looks like. I'm just pulling in some data sets. Um, excuse me, I actually don't need this part, but anyway, this is the part that we need right here, SK learns ensembles. So I'm also going to pull in this data set, the iris data set. So we've seen the iris data set before, if you guys remember, right? Um, it's kind of like that um, basic, it's about 150 uh, different, I think, data, data points. So just kind of now that we're going off of this. And I think it can be either zero, one, or two is the different um, classifications. And so actually I'm going to ignore this since we actually, this is from the code from the other part. So we don't need these parts. 
but I'm going to use this classifier. I'm going to build up this classifier, this random forest. We're going to use n estimators, basically saying how many little digital trees are we going to use in our random forest um, and our max depth. I'm giving a random state just for it to be easier for us to like be consistent through here. Um, this is actually kind of an important part that I would kind of say it's kind of glazed over. If you can give a random state, if it's some kind of random part of it, um, it's a really good practice to give it like the same random state every time. Otherwise, when you run it over and over and over again, you might get different results each time you run it, but that's not a pure random um, chance. So to make things consistent in your training stuff, it's good just to give it like a certain state because you're not really talking about like any one particular model. You're kind of saying like, what's the overall like hyperparameters and training data that we're giving it. So it's good practice to just set a random state by itself. Okay. And then right here, I'm just feeding it in this data. So I created this classifier right here. So if I split this up here, you know, I can just run this by itself. And you can see I made my classifier. In fact, if I actually did, if I printed this out, you'll see some attributes of this classifier. You can see here all the different options that it uses. Um, bootstrap equals true, class weights, all these different parts are, are set. So this is kind of a nice way to just kind of see this classifier is built and ready to be trained. It's basically ready to grow. So then I'm going to go ahead and fit it with this classifier dot fit. And I'm just passing in the data in this case. Um, so this is like our X and this is our Y. Okay, cool. And so if I do this now, I will predict it. And cool, it's, made, it's basically been trained, right? It's all set and ready to go. So now what you can do is actually feed it in um, different predictions. For example, um, there's four different features in the iris data set. So I'm just putting in like random numbers here. But if you give it, say, okay, feature one is 0 .1, 0 .01, second feature is 0 0.02, third is 0 .01, um, and so on, right? And it can say, okay, what's this prediction going to be? And you can see it predicted to be class zero. So that basically is how you would feed it in new data. Basically, this could be your um, X test right here. And note, this is just one data point right here. But I could, for example, if I can do this right, it's not too late in the day. I hope I can not mess this up too bad. There we go. So if I wanted like another data point right here, you can see this is going to be a separate data point. So you're like, oh, okay, let's say 0.5. Uh, 0.3, So this, whatever data point we feed it in, what's it going to classify? I actually have no idea. So if we run this now, you can say, hey, it's also the classifying is zero. So the idea here is that we're feeding it data and say, what do you think each one of these data points are going to be? OK. All right, any questions on kind of this process? OK, cool. So the main thing to kind of pull from this is that we can build our random classifier, or sorry, our random forest classifier. Um, we can skip this part that's just getting the data itself. And then we can say, OK, what kind of hyperparameters we want for this uh, random forest? And then actually training it with this dot fit, classifier.fit, and then predicting off it class, uh, classifier.predict. So note that this is very similar to using sklearn's decision tree. Um, it's basically the same process. It's just that it's a random forest instead. OK. So. Uh, like what cool feature I kind of mentioned is that like we can actually know what made it the most important thing. Like basically what feature is the most important since it's relatively, um, again, like I said, it's just a bunch of decision trees. So we can actually see how those decision trees all kind of add into making that random for us. So um, you can see here, we can actually do our classifier and our feature importances. So this basically is pulling out all the different feature importances. Um, I'm just doing this little quick for loop to make it a little obvious, like what is each feature and what are the different importances. So if I do this now, you can see here is that this is the name itself. So this is the name of the feature and then this is the important score. So the, basically the higher the score, the more importance it is. So you can see here is that most of the classification is coming from the fact that it's from the petal width and the petal length. Um, the sepal, which is some part of the plant, I'm no biologist. Um, but has less importance. Though note that the sepal length here is more important with um, 0 0.10 over 0 0.006. This is a higher importance. So again, this is gonna be really nice because then you can see what are the, th like how is your decision tree, your, sorry, your random forest actually making those decisions? Okay, cool. Um, any questions then? Cool, all right. And just in practice, I would honestly say, like, if you just as a quick, like, let, let me just see how well this performs, a random forest does surprising well for most data sets. So um, it's, I like to say, like, it's just one of the first things, like, I like to do, um, and then see if I can do more, com more complex um, 
algorithms and see if I can train this part. But um, remember the big part about random forests is that um, it's gonna, you know, if you have a very large model, you're gonna have to basically store that in memory. Um, one thing I didn't mention about is that you can take this, um, so we haven't really talked too much about like very large data and like what that looks like, but what's kind of cool about random forests since you're basically training each individual model here, which is each individual decision tree, you can basically train each model in parallel, which means you can train like model one and model four at the same time, like on, for example, different computers or on the same computer and then combine them together later. So parallel processing is really easy to do for not just random forest, but any bagging model itself. Okay, cool. All right, so if that sounds good to you guys, we can go into the next kind of strategy of ensemble methods. So our next ensemble method is our boosting methods. Okay, so um, kind of like what is boosting? So this is a kind of a similar thing in the sense that we're combining many weak letters to create a strong letter, but it's usually what we call like an iterative process where basically you learn from the previous learner, sequential learning. So there's kind of a subtle point that is, might not be super obvious at first, is that bagging is kind of limited to how well it can perform. Because if you imagine like if you have the smartest person in the class who knows like the smartest math person in the class, right? You will only be as good as the smartest math person in that class, right? Like you can't like having like essentially, you know, forget my language here, like dumber students, right? They're, the dumber students are not gonna help the smarter students get better, right? It's basically they're kind of capped off. So what boosting does basically says you start off with a learner and you basically say, hey, what mistakes did you make? Hey, you made those mistakes. Let's learn from those mistakes and go even better. So what's really nice about this is that we can actually make it improve it more and more and more. It's an iterative model. So basically you kind of like keep looking at its mistakes and like essentially the way I kind of uh, view this is like um, the boosting part is like whenever the learner makes a mistake, you say, hey, you made a mistake. Like it would be like equivalent um, if you had a test and let's say you got a 90%. It's like, it's like, oh, those like three questions you missed we're gonna make those worth like five extra points. Like, so you then get a 90%, you got like a 50% on your tests. And which would be like really mean if you were like a real teacher, but like that's kind of essentially what we're doing with boosting. It's like, hey, those problems, like the ones that you missed, guess what? Those are gonna be worth a lot more. So you start studying those really hard questions right there. And then any more mistakes you make, like, oh, those questions that you missed the second time, those are gonna be worth even more. So that's kind of the idea of the iterative process, okay? Does that make sense to people? Kind of like generally going through and we'll see a little bit of example of this but the idea here is that you have to get, learn from the previous learner or like you can think of it like a student improving over time versus like combining many you know weak learners together so some disadvantage to this is that you can't do it in parallel is that you just can't like i mean it can't easily be parallelized essentially you have to know the previous how well the previous learner did before you can train the new learner so you can't do this in two separate instances or basically at the same time. Um, you have to know what the previous learner does. So it's a lot harder to parallelize in that way. Okay, so note that it won't scale very well. And why scale, I mean that if you need larger and larger data sets or you have huge amounts of data, you basically have to wait for each model to train all by itself and then train the next model. Okay, so some basic methods that we kind of talk about in the curriculum are AdaBoost, which is super popular in gradient boosting which basically, um, if you look in the curriculum, they talk about XGBoost. And XGBoost basically is just a kind of a really efficient form of gradient boosting. So we'll go over these two parts next. Okay. So we'll go in this little notebook right here. There we go. And so we'll talk about Ada boosting first, which is adaptive boosting. And so this is kind of probably most similar to um, what I just described. It's essentially what we do. We train the model and you say like, this is like our first model, our first learner. And you can think of like the blue right here versus the red. I think it's actually comes directly from the curriculum. Is that the blue in here is saying, oh, you correctly identified it, right? So the blue is on the blue versus the red here is like, hey, you're not doing so great, right? So then what you say, okay, you made these mistakes, these three blue ones, and you can see it by its size. It's really emphasizing, okay, we're going to increase like the weight of these errors saying, hey, these errors now count a lot more. And we try to retrain it. And so then it says, okay, well, these ones count a lot more. So I'm gonna make it a decision to make sure to get those ones right. But then you say, hey, these ones over here, well, you didn't do a very good job predicting on these ones. So now we're gonna try again and we're gonna increase um, the weight of these red ones that you messed up on the second time 
and make these worth more. And you can say, okay, now we make a new part right here. So essentially we keep like going across, making, um, making adjustments to the errors it makes and making it worth more. So that way it kind of tries to fit better to these. And then what you do, you take each one of these learners, so like basically learner one, learner two, learner three, and we combine them together to make it so you say, hey, how well do you perform on the overall data set itself? Okay, so the whole idea here is that we're using iterative models where each one kind of use, like learns from the previous example and then combining them all together to make this guy. And this is why, like I said, you can't parallelize this very easily since you have to wait for this one to train first, see what errors it makes, and then modify those weights to see what errors it will make and then do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Does that make sense to people? Thumbs up if it sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's a very like kind of going through. And so um, at the end here, like you can think of this as like voting essentially going through. And there's a little bit of math going on here, which is all messed up like this. Um, I won't go over this part because truthfully, you don't need to like memorize this stuff. But if you're curious, there's definitely an algorithm for data boosting that goes beyond like, you know, for example, I said, oh, increase the error. How much do you increase the error by? You know, there's an algorithm to say how much you increase it by. And then when we combine together, how do you know this learner versus this learner versus this learner? How do you combine them together in a meaningful way? And essentially that's part of the algorithm for the mathematics. But since to you kind of honest, most of the time you won't have to deal with that. We're going to skip over that. Um, you can definitely read it through the curriculum. Okay. Sound good? Okay. And like I said, um, pretty much every like um, SK learns um, classifiers, right, are going to work very similar. So you can see here, basically, I'm importing this the whole code to predict anything. So you have your X train, your Y train, and then making your predictions. So essentially, if you replace this with random forest, you have the same thing. Of course, there's extra like from the um, documentation, you can see there's other parts you can hear, for example, the base estimator. In this case, in this visual example, this is probably a decision tree, right? Basically, you're making this part, but you can have other um, base estimators and saying how many times do we have estimators, you know? In that case, the previous one, we only had three estimators, but you can have many estimators. Um, and then also we can do different losses, say, how do you count, um, like what counts as a bad error? So this loss right here is being optimized, saying what makes that error stronger and stronger? Cool, all right. And what's, oh, sir, one that's really cool about this too is that you can actually pull out the estimators. So you can actually, since you trained at each one, you can actually pull out each individual estimator and go through. So what's really nice is that by its nature, you don't necessarily know how it works, but um, if you know the base estimators of the decision tree, something that's relatively easy for you to pull out the meaning from it, you can actually see for each estimator how they perform and then how they're basically combined together with these weights. Okay. Cool. So that's kind of a nice little part here. And you can also get feature importance, especially if you have a base estimator that is going to be able to um, give you that information. All right. So um, some quick things about hyperparameters, like you can see here, like I mentioned, the base estimator decision tree. So note that this decision tree can basically be modified. So you can say, hey, this decision tree is going to have a max depth of four. So these are hyperparameters of your base estimator. So it's kind of a little meta going on here. But like, Basically, your hyperparameter is the hyperparameters of your um, base estimator, and you can go from there. Okay. Cool. All right. Any questions? Yeah. All right. Kind of going along a little bit. <laughs> it's getting a little tired of hearing my voice the whole time, so I just want to make sure you guys have any questions or not. All right. So gradient boosting. Um, has anyone gone through this curriculum part yet um, up to this point? I can see some headshots, so good. Um, that's all right. You know, obviously you guys can go through it and stuff. Um, I will say is that gradient boosting tends to be one of the most like head scratching, be like, what's going on? Um, and so just kind of know the idea here, this is from the curriculum, is that we start off with essentially our um, our Y or like our training data, right? So you can see here this ground truth. And essentially what we do, we go further and further. And instead of just like simply making a better matter model on the original like data set, we actually say, okay, make a model on this data set. And then say how, and then we say, how good was that model? And you say, okay, well, we calculate the residuals. And basically instead of going back and say, okay, we'll minimize the residuals, you literally train your algorithm on the residuals and say, how well can you fit to these residuals? And then you do from that one, it's like, well, how well can you fit on these residuals? So the residuals of the residuals, 
and go further and further and deeper and deeper. And the idea here is essentially you're doing the gradient boosting, gradient meaning like, oh, the difference between each part. So you can see basically as we get deeper and deeper, we're getting closer and closer, residuals are getting smaller and smaller. And that's what we want. And then we combine all of those together at the very end to, get, um, to make one super learner. And remember that you can see here of like why it's more sequential learning. You have to figure out this first model before you get the residuals and then you get this part, get the next residuals and so on. So that's kind of like the basic idea of like creating this um, gradient boosting. So like I said here, you can use the mean squared error. Like, so that's basically just saying how the error is. So whatever you're using to define what the error is, the residuals, right? Um, and then we're gonna use this by uh, minimizing that just like you normally would with any um, algorithm by gradient descent. And then what we do, we just iteratively go through the residuals. Like, well, how well did you do on the part? Like, what are the parts you messed up on? And then train off of that. So this is kind of the steps going forward. You can imagine you fit a dot, uh, oh man, I'm not going to tell you. Um, fit a model to the data, right? So you can see F1 is my very first model. So F1 of X, so X is all like that training data and Y is the prediction. So you say, okay, Y is our prediction. And you say, okay, like, well, you did this well in here. So Y is your ground truth here. So Y minus F, F1 of X, this would basically give you your residuals, H of X or H1 of X. So essentially this is saying how different is your true from your predicted. And then you would train off of this H1 of X, say, okay, let me add this part into here. And that will basically define my new model and going forward. So you just keep repeating this process over and over again. All right. Um, I think it makes more sense if I show you in a little code. So I'm going to kind of show you like what this would look like, like if you didn't use SK learns, like, you know, um, gradient boosting thing, which is optimized or XG boost is op optimization. Um, we're just going to kind of train iteratively over and over and over again. So just kind of know um, part of this was adapted from um, uh, let's hear this GitHub repo right here, which is I never can pronounce his name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, he's French. I don't know if anyone can pronounce his name right here. Um, but um, I, yeah, anyway, he is an author of uh, Hands on Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn TensorFlow, which is a book I highly recommend. I think I might have shared this out a couple times to different people. Um, but actually, he has a GitHub where he kind of shows some of the, the code that he has in the, um, in the curriculum. So it is available for everyone. Obviously, the context is a little harder to get from because the book's not there. Um, but that's where most of this data, um, code's coming from. So just kind of know if that's where part of it's coming from. And also a little mix of this gradient classifier. So first things first, we got to import a library. So I'm going to make some data here. So I'm just making some random data to show you a little bit how this would work. And you can see here, I made a little quadratic formula right here with some extra um, noise. So you can see here, this is gonna be my noise right here with a random um, random number. So you can see it's going to be here. This is just basic data generation, right? And you can see that little alpha. So we wanna basically fit something along that um, parabola, right? And we can do our X-train test split. I actually won't use this, I think, in the code, but know that you would normally do this on an X-train and then X test to evaluate your model. So let's go into training our residuals. Come on, there we go. All right, so in this case, you'll notice that I'm using a regressor and that's because I'm just trying to say I'm fitting it along this line versus a classification. But note the classification would work the, in the similar way. I'm just using regressor because it's a little more obvious of like how you measure that um, difference, okay? So um, what I'm doing here, and I'll split this up in different parts. As I make my first, um, oops, I should run this. Oh my gosh, there we go. I'm running my decision tree regressor, right? There's a decision tree regressor, and then I'm going to go ahead and train it. So I'm just using a max depth of two, just using a random state. In that case, I think it was 42, just to keep it consistent. Okay, and I'm just going to fit it on that x y training data. So you can see how well it's going to fit on here. Okay, so I fit this guy. Cool. I made my decision tree. Obviously, this decision tree is going to make some mistakes, right? So you can imagine it's going to be off by a certain amount. So if you look at this, for example. If I were to print this out, you can see here basically this guy is saying, okay, take the ground truth, which is the true data, right? Subtract off the prediction of the test right here and see how well it performs. So you can see here basically are all of like um, this Y2 is representing the residuals. How different is it from the actual true data, okay? And then what we do, we take that Y2, say, can you train off of those residuals? So that's what this is doing right here is now we train a new decision tree, right? Our decision tree regressor, right? And we're training it off of these residuals and we perform this one. 
And then we do a, a third one, a third iteration and say, okay, we now have this new decision tree. We're going to predict it off of the X and say, how far are you off from those residuals? So Y3, and we've trained it off of that one. So in the end here, we actually have three different um, uh, decision tree classifiers. And each one is basically being trained off of something from the previous one. And in the end, we just combine them together essentially to make into a better model. So kind of observe like how this looks like is I didn't show you each part. Um, this is kind of code that was from that um, GitHub that I showed is that I'm basically gonna plot them all together. So note that this sum um, regressor right here basically is going to combine them. And so we're gonna see two different graphs. Um, one is gonna be the actual data and one's gonna be the residuals of that previous one. And then we're gonna iteratively get better and better and better. So it makes more sense if I show you what goes here. So you can ignore this part, just know that this is to plot it all out. So if I do this, you can see here, this is our very first um, decision tree regressor in the green. And you can see, yeah, that's all right, right? So this is what it's training off of and seeing how well it performs. And this right here on the right, um, on the right here will be our actual um, predictions. This is gonna be residuals. So our first one doesn't have any residuals, right? So it's just gonna be the simple, you know, Y data. And you can see, yeah, that's all right, right? And it's not perfect, but it can do better. So the next iteration we say, okay, instead of trading off of this um, data set or off this data set again, we say, okay, well, how, well, like, how far off are you from these data points? And these are the residuals. And we train this regressor on these residuals. So you can see here, for example, like these points are really far off. So you can see that residuals are gonna be a little bit higher and stuff like this. And we're gonna train this to try to fit on top of here. And then what we do on this actual data, we combine this, um, sorry, this model right here. So this is our first regressor. And then our second regressor, we add these together to create this thing. And you can see on the actual data, it's actually doing quite well. It's doing a lot better than the first one. You guys see that difference here? Okay, cool. And then we basically say, okay, from this right here, or sorry, from this right here, you can see it's not perfect. The residuals still exist, right? So we're gonna do a third time, say, okay, fit on the residuals from this plot fit your data or fit your um, decision tree onto here. And you can see there's a little bit of extra part and you can see um, it gets a little bit better. So you can see after three iterations, it's, you can't see it too much, but you can see on the right here from going from here to here, you can see it's fitting a little bit better. It's kind of doing that little zigzag going up. So you can imagine just repeating this over and over and over and over again until basically you get a closer and closer model. And it's basically training off of its previous learners um, mistakes. Okay. So what this looks like in practice, well, let me ask you guys, does this all make sense to everyone? Of what's going on between here to here and then going to this uh, next row? I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, it's just not making sense to me. Uh, just mm -hmm. uh, going back to the first residual. So you're doing mm -hmm. Y minus the first residual, right? Mm -hmm. Can you uh, scroll a little bit, please? Oh, sure. So you're talking about like this very first one, right? Here. It, um, I guess the second one then. So this one right here? Oh yeah, yeah, right there. So Y minus the first mm -hmm. regression. Wouldn't mm -hmm. that not, like if you have a data point that's a negative already, that's gonna be different than a positive. Right, I so, um, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I can't, I, don't, I, I can't put it into words right now, but isn't that, like it's not, like the absolute value is not gonna, like y right. minus negative six versus y minus six when you do the data points. Right, and so remember that this is going to show the relative diff uh, distance. So you're kind of saying like, let's, I'm gonna draw a little plot here. And Adam, tell me if this is kind of what you're saying. Is if I have like a plot like this, and let's say we have in y the plot, the data points like this, right? Like yeah. the y is negative. Um, and then let's say, I'm just gonna draw this like in, I don't know, uh, let's say blue. Okay, and this is like my um, point right here. This is like what my prediction does, my decision regressor, right? Yeah. And you're saying like, oh, it should be more negative, right? It's for this subtraction, like, cause you're saying like not right. absolute value. Exactly, because they're both negative. Right, and so that's just gonna basically just show that it's going to be the distance between these two points. So like if you imagine this is like negative one and this is like negative four, it's gonna be minus one, minus four. So it's gonna be uh, minus one, minus negative four, 
which will give you three. A oh, right. Three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, it's okay. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. No, it's a good point, right? And you can, the way you can also imagine this is if I drag these points both up together, this is describing the distance. And if it's above, it would be negative in that case. It's, it makes a mistake in the opposite direction. So if yeah. instead this was like zero, it would be minus one, minus zero, which would give you a different distance of minus one. So Actually, it's just kind of, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, so um, once you have that, basically, you know the if the, regret, um, the residuals are above or below, you can basically keep going back and forth. So you can imagine like if I were to kind of show you the steps of like what each part, you can say going from here to here, and then from here, well, I guess going from here to here, this one goes to here, and this one goes to here. So this is just basically showing how we combine all of the regressors together. So let's see here if I go like this, and then this one's going to here, this one's going to here. So basically this step is just going off of the next one, the next one, the next one. But to get this final on the right, you're combining all of these together to get this one graph over here. Does that make sense to people? Okay. Cool. Thumbs up, sideways, thumbs down. See some sideways? Okay. Okay. Does anyone want to kind of try to iterate a little bit like um, what's kind of losing them? Is it the step from here to here? That's kind of confusing what's going on? Or is it more like them combining together? I think like I understand this like sequence. I think I just conceptually have a hard time understanding why the residuals are improving the model, like why incorporating, dip, like why running a model on the residuals improves the original model. So, yeah. You're basically like the way I kind of like to think about this is like you're basically saying how, like how, um, like going, like ignore this third one, but going from here to here, it's saying, okay, your model doesn't do a very good job on these parts. And so we train the model, say, hey, if you were to bump it up by this much over here, that would be equivalent to like getting the residuals closer. So if we add from here into this part right here, we would actually get kind of like closer, which gives us this guy. So essentially we're kind of going into finer tooth. It's kind of like saying, all right, how much of a mistake did you make? All right, you needed to bump this up by like 0.5 in order to get on here. Mm -hmm. And so the reason why we do this is because like, I, you know, if we were, if the machine was smarter essentially, right? It would be, like, oh, it's exactly by 0.0342 or something like that. Um, and say, okay, you need to bump up when it's at X equals, I don't know, negative 0.5, you should bump it up by, you know, uh, point, uh, 0.18 and it would bump it up by 0.18. And so that's kind of like the ideal part. Like if we just adjusted this little part here up by 0.18, that would make it perfect. And so that's what we're doing here. Essentially, we're iterating over each part and saying, well, you know, instead of having the perfect exact like error, we're using the model itself to try to estimate that error and then add that error back in. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of. Yeah, I think that helps me understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's still kind of weird being like, wait, how does this work exactly? I was I've been the same way. Um, and I'm just gonna iterate this one more time. Is that like, let's say this point right here, this little tiny data point is off by, I'm gonna draw a little line, is off by this much. So you can kind of see that little line right here. And like, you can imagine this is our zero, right? So like, if I had this perfect, right, it would be something like, maybe it's like, I don't know, this point right here. So like, if I bumped it up by this much, right, you would say, okay, then you would get it perfect, right? If I bumped up this green guy, up by that much, you would get that point exactly right, okay? And that's what this model is trying to do. It's like, okay, like it's essentially trying to figure out the best way to draw a relatively simple curve to bump it up by that much. But you can see it overshoots. In this case, it says, oh, go up this much. So what's gonna happen is that the green line is gonna be slightly above like this. And if you look carefully, if you kind of see this part right here, you can see that's essentially what happens right here. It's overshooting on top of that. And you can kind of see that little similarity where I drew in red right here. Hopefully you guys can see that okay. Um, but you can kind of see like it overshoots. And essentially the reason why we do this is essentially we don't want it to be perfect. We want it to give it a little fuzz. We don't want it to be exactly right. And that's why we're essentially training these like really simple models on each part 
to give it a little bit of fuzz, essentially. Okay, that was going to be my other question is how many times would you do this? Um, yeah, good question. It must be a balance between overfitting and underfitting. Right? Yeah, good point. And that's what the next part is. So cool. Thanks. Good segue. So, um, and hopefully that explanation kind of help people out. So let's say, for example, we do the same thing with, um, we're going to use gradient boosting regressor. So the same idea here, instead of me going manually going through, it's going to be a little more optimized. And we're going to use three es estimators. And then we're going to do something a little bit worse is say, okay, let's overfit it. Let's try 200 estimators. So it's going to do 200, oh, like basically that same process, but do it 200 times. And we can see here as we go forward, this graph is going to look, this is going to be underfitting. Where over this one, you can see definitely overfitting over here, right? So you can see it's like, well, it's trying to get all these little nooks and crannies and stuff like that. And it's probably no good. So some strategies we can do like regularization, basically. Um, one thing we can do is also early stopping. So I actually didn't implement this myself because it's in this notebook, um, that GitHub that I mentioned. So I'm just going to show you that code versus me running that code. So um, you can see there's actually the same graph right here since I use the same code going up from there. We can see here we can do some early stopping. So essentially what we can do, which is, let's see here. So you can see our different data points right here. We can start off with 120 estimators, right? And essentially what we're going to do is for each estimator, we're going to just basically see how well it performs each one. So essentially to say, what's the error for each of those estimations? And that way we can basically start off with saying, hey, let's start off with um, something that's really, that's not very good, right? And then increase it a better and better. So in this case, you can see is that um, since we can get out each estimator every single time from doing boosting, we can actually plot out the error. So we can see how well the error here is compared to the validation. So remember that X test, right? And so we can see here is that each one of these is basically the number of estimators. So as we increase the number of estimators, we're having 20 iterations, 30 iterations, 40 iterations, and so on. The error um, based on the validation is going to get better and better and better and better, right? Until a certain point where essentially it's overfitting and it's going to go in the other direction, right? And that's where we can find this minimum right here. So one strategy basically says, all right, let's overfit it on purpose and then like rewind it until we find that spot, which you can see might not be the best solution, right? What's, why might you not want to do it in this way? Like it works, right? But what's inefficient about this? I mean, it seems like it'd be hard to find where that minimum is if you overshoot it because the difference is so little. Yeah, I guess that could be one thing, right? It could be hard to find this. It turns out we can actually find this relatively easy because if you just compare each time we do it and say what the error is and just find the minimum. It's kind of like having a list of numbers, right? And just find the minimum of that one. Um, the other thing really is that if you were to continue on, what if I put like 5,000 estimators? Well, what's going to happen is that this thing is going to keep going over and over. But we know already in hindsight that we only need about like 50-ish estimators. And if you kept going to 5,000, basically you're wasting all that time, basically iterating over and over and over and over again. And it's going to be waste all this time. So it'd be nice to basically say, hey, once we hit a certain point, when it starts going up again, let's stop it there. And that will be our minimum error, right? Because as we know, kind of like as we overfit, the validation error is going to get worse and worse. So we can stop it once it starts getting too bad. And that's what this code right here basically goes through. It says, hey, let's check out this n estimators and basically kind of keep going for this range going through here and basically keep improving it over and over then. And once this error, in this case, this validation error reaches a certain point, go ahead and just stop. And that's what this is right here. So if the error basically reaches over a certain th threshold, which in this case, I think the minimum error gear going up. So if the error kind of goes upwards again, we stop it right here. And that way you can basically prevent this happening where you're going, you have to train the whole thing and then look back on your estimation and stop. But it's the same concept. Does that make sense to everyone? Cool. Yeah. And the reason why you can do this again is because we can look at every estimator. Basically, we can look at the iterative process and we can see um, any time it goes forward, we can say, oh, go to the next part. Like, like you saw when I did the, um, the Y2 and the Y3, we can create those different residuals ourselves. We don't have to um, use a black box, essentially. We can know how each one performs. So we can train each one individually over and over and over again. Um, yeah, do you guys have any questions enough of um, anything you kind of talked about? I think we're about at time. Yes.
Yeah, so um, just kind of know the two differences between these ensembles, which are really popular. Um, bagging methods, which are usually random forests, um, but it doesn't have to be random forests. We're basically bootstrap aggregation and boosting methods, where we're doing basically sequential learning. Basically, we're learning from the previous learner um, versus bagging methods, but essentially each one is on its own. So you can see, like, for parallelization, if you wanted to do each one on its own and then combine them all together, right, you would get a pretty decent, you know, learner. However, it's kind of capped off to how well it performs versus boosting methods. You can't paralyze it because you have to wait for the previous learner for it, but it means that each one can get better and better. So your first estimator will be a lot worse than your 50th estimator, for example, um, versus bagging methods. Each learner doesn't really care about the previous learner. It's just like combining all at the very end. All right. Cool. Um, yeah, and I will again throw back. Um, I love this book, um, Hands On Machine Learning uh, with Scikit-Learn. Um, it's, I think it's a really useful book. He does a great job of kind of explaining things through. But um, at the very least, I think if you want to kind of get some extra practice and seeing how this goes through, you can try running some of this code and kind of seeing how this works and kind of break it down since I kind of went through it relatively quickly. Okay. Cool. All right. So I'll go ahead and stop recording here. And.